Hello and welcome to another episode of A Platformer in Bevy. In this episode, I'm going to be revisiting our animation system that we implemented in the first episode. We're going to be creating a custom asset in Bevy and then using Bevy's asset loader in order to be able to load that asset into our game using the asset serve. I'll also be implementing a suggestion that I was given on the first video about using timers instead of an F32 since all the logic of wrapping around is already implemented. The first step is just to do some housekeeping. This is turning our frame time from using an F32 into a timer. I didn't do this in the first episode because I didn't realize that there were already built in functionality in order to count the number of times a timer has finished in a single tick. But thanks to Earthman who pointed me to the documentation that shows me how to do this, I've decided to go back and re-implement this. This just greatly simplifies the amount of code that we need to manage and maintain ourselves since the bevy maintainers will make sure that the timer always works as expected. The only thing I needed to do was implement some helper function simply so I didn't have to call dot zero on every. The only real difference is the frames function since this needs to cast the u32 that bevy will return into a u size in order for it to be used as an index. This has no real impact on our game's code outside of removing the need for us to implement the wrapping logic ourselves. You'll see later on how this changes the code ever so slightly by removing about three lines. Now onto the meat of this video, actually making the asset that we will be using for our animations. The first step in actually making an asset is to derive the type UUID tray. This tray is used by Bevy in order to distinguish assets from normal structs and to make sure that they are unique, but maintain their stability across multiple builds of your game. The type UUID derive requires you to specify a UUID metadata directly underneath. You can find plenty of websites online that will generate random UUIDs for you. A randomly generated UUID is not guaranteed to be unique, but the odds of it colliding with an already existing one are so astronomically small they are considered to be unique for all intensive purposes. There are methods of generating truly unique UUIDs, but these are managed by central authorities, which therefore means they have restrictions on how you can acquire your number that then you use to generate other UUIDs. The only change we need to make to the actual struct in order for it to work as an asset is that we're going to include the handle to the texture atlas. We're doing this so that when we update the handle attached to our entity, we can look up in the asset which texture atlas this animation relates to and therefore update the texture atlas with automated systems. Unlike we had before where the user needed to remember to update the texture atlas, this would cause crashes if the old texture atlas didn't have as many frames as the new one since Bevy doesn't have any checks to make sure your texture atlas doesn't try to index out of bound. We then need to make some slight modifications to our animation system. This primarily revolves around replacing the component that was originally the animation itself with a handle to the animation in the assets and then acquiring access to the assets so that we can look up the information we need. Then in the body of our function, we need to include at the top, let sum animation equal animation dot get animation else continue. We can also report an error that the animation was not loaded here. I've removed this for brevity though. Doing this will attempt to get us the underlying asset that our handle relates to. We can then use this exactly the same as we were using the component before. This is also where you'll see how changing our frame time from a F32 into a timer affects our code since we no longer need to make sure that we reset the F32 back to below one frame time every time we check it, instead allowing the timer to take care of that code for us. The next change we need to make to our original code in order to get our animation system to continue working is to update our animations resource. This resource originally contained the texture handle and the animation data, but we can now consolidate this just into the handle to the sprite animation, since the rest of the information is then acquired from the assets. This also requires us to change the from world implementation to insert the texture atlas and sprite animation instead of just loading it all in like we were originally. I've cut most of this out since it is a lot of copy and paste code that is very identical to the code we originally had, just slight modifications to change how it inserts the sprite animation into the map. A new system that we need to add is the update animation components system. This system is responsible for updating an entity's components whenever it's handled to a sprite animation changes. This does things such as correcting the timer's duration, updating the texture atlas to be correct, and making sure that the sprite's index is not out of bounds within the animation length. This system uses the changed query filter in order to only run on entities that have had their handle change. 
This means we don't have to worry about our animation constantly being reset, even though we're not changing anything. In addition to this new system, for convenience, I've added the add frame time system. Unlike the previous system that waited for the handle to change, this system looks for a handle that has been added, and then also filters if the component does not have a frame time. If both these conditions are true, this removes the need for an animation bundle, since all you need to do is add the handle to an animation to a texture atlas sprite that already exists in the world. And this system will make sure that all the correct components are added if they are not already present. This is everything you need in order to adjust the previously implemented animation system into assets. There's no point showing the game at this point since there is no noticeable difference. But in the next section, we are going to be removing a large amount of boilerplate since we'll make it so that we can load animations from files. This reduces the amount of copying and pasting that we need to do in our primary code. It also allows us to edit our animations without needing to recompile our game. First thing we need to do to make our animations be able to load it is to create an animation loader. For the sake of our animations, since they don't need anything persistent or pre-initialized, we can simply use a marker struct, in this case, the animation loader struct. We then implement asset loader on top of this struct. The asset loader trait tells Bevy that this struct can be used with the asset server in order to load assets of a certain type. We use the extension method to declare what type of file extensions this asset loader should be passed in order to do its job properly. In this case, I'm using the SAN, which stands for Sprite Animation, and .ron. The reason we use .ron at the end of our file extension is so that any IDE extension that allows for syntax highlighting will automatically detect that this is a Rust object notation file and give us syntax highlighting for free. The other method that we need to implement is the load method. In this case, this method simply pins an async function that calls an additional load animation method, which I'll go into in a second. The load method itself is not asynchronous, but will return an async future that Bevy can then run in a background thread, preventing the game from being slowed down by assets loading. In order to load assets from disk, we need to make an additional struct that represents the data on disk. We can't use the same struct that we're using for our animations, since this uses handles and these can only be created at runtime. Do not serialize since they will lose information such as the texture's path since these handles are hashed for speed. In this particular case, you will also see that I'm using SIRD default and an optional ID. This allows us to specify multiple animations in a folder. We then provide a sum ID for any animation that we want to override and give a specific ID to. We also take in the frame rate, the size of the tile, the number of rows and columns in the texture atlas, and the path to the texture that we want to slice up in the atlas. We then derive deserialize on this struct so that we can load it from a string. I also implement serialize. I do this so that I can serialize a dummy copy that then I modify those values in a file in order to make it easier to get the structure correct. This is the main body of that load animation function that we called earlier. The first thing it does is use ron to deserialize the bytes that it has passed into a vector of animation assets. We then iterate through each of those assets, firstly acquiring a handle to that path so that we can pass this to our texture atlas. The texture atlas is then created with all the data that we provided from our asset, such as the image handle that we just created, the tile size, the number of columns, rows, and for this particular implementation, we have no padding and offset because we do not serialize this into our asset. We then create what Bevy calls a loaded asset. This is a type stripped away form so that our asset can be passed to the asset server and inserted into its correct asset asynchronously. We're specifying this here so that we can also include a dependency to the asset's texture path. Providing the texture path here will not hash it like a handle, therefore allowing the asset server to go and load that file specifically, since it now knows that this file needs to be loaded. We then check to see if our asset has an ID specified. If it does, we insert the texture atlas with that ID before, so that if you want to access the texture atlas for a specific animation, you use the animations ID underscore atlas as your asset label. We then create our actual sprite animation. The set labeled asset method will return a handle that we can then use when creating our sprite animation as our texture atlas handle. We then simply provide all the information that we have for the texture atlas and then insert this with the ID without texture atlas appended. 
This means if we want to access a specific animation in a file, we can use its ID on the end of the file path as an asset label to get that specific animation. If an animation is not specified, we do exactly the same thing, but instead of appending the ID to the atlas, we just call it atlas. And instead of setting labeled asset, we set default asset. Setting the default asset tells Bevy which asset to return if no label is specified. It is not actually mandatory to set a default asset, but this will cause issues if you then call load without specifying an appropriate label, since there is no asset that will be returned and the handle will simply point to nothing. All the code for this video was live stream, so if you're at all interested in seeing me working on some of the code for these videos, you can go check out that live stream or try and catch the next one actually live. I hope you've all enjoyed the video and will subscribe to my channel to see the next one. I would also like to request that you leave in the comments what you'd like to see me do in the next video since I'm kind of running out of ideas that are unique. So I would like to know what specific topic people want me to cover in more detail. You can also go over and support me on Patreon if you feel like you'd like to support the channel or simply just share my videos with friends.